particularly in Kerala, is that thinking has been ostracized. Uh, thinking has been virtually criminalized. It's become a sin or a crime to think. I believe otherwise. I'm glad that all of you agree with me. And I noticed that my friend Zach has just signed on. Wonderful. Welcome, Zach. Wonderful. So let me offer a nugget of thought to begin with. Uh, now, uh, this is, I must say, uh, with apologies to my brother-in-law, Thomas, because I've been having a running argument with him for the last uh, couple of years or even more on a question whether or not um, everything about a human being is already determined. There is something called, uh, say, destiny, which is already set. And that uh, in this world, there is only a, an illusion of freedom. Um, I hope I'm representing his thought. He, he, he has his own arguments, which I respect. Um, now, I, I, this is at the back of my mind in, in sharing this piece of thought with you. Uh, and all of us know, for example, that um, during the Reformation and, uh, and thereafter, Calvin, for example, uh, the great Reformation leader in Switzerland, Geneva, I uh, believed in predetermination. Um, he believed that everything was predetermined uh, and therefore, correspondingly, there is a, a tendency to de-emphasize <clears throat> the importance of personal choice and uh, personal freedom, etc. So the relationship between preordination and personal freedom is one of the most complex issues in theology as well as philosophy. Uh, I will not go into either theology or philosophy. I'll just pause it or raise this issue uh, with you so that you can continue to, to think about it. Now, there is the view that most people are bound to be insensitive to things spiritual. Many people tell me that I'm a fool to try and, uh, you know, change the situation or make people think or um, make people re-examine their position, etc. Uh, you know, uh, is, there is this assumption that some people, <clears throat> only a chosen few, are meant to be spiritually sensitive, but the vast majority of the people are somehow uh, meant to be or doomed to be or destined to be insensitive to spiritual matters. And this idea may be reflected, for example, in the idea of the chosen few. So Jesus himself said that many are called, but only a few are chosen. Many are called, but only a few are chosen. Now, what or who makes a difference between them? Is it some personal character trait on the part of those who are chosen that make them chosen or the absence of the, those traits and those people who are rejected. No explanation is given in the text. Jesus simply states this uh, uh, without giving explanations. Uh, we think, for example, of um, uh, the, the, the inhabitants of the city of Capernaum. Jesus virtually breaks his heart over the people of Capernaum and says, Oh, you who dwell in Capernaum, if the great works done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, those people would have uh, 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 repented and saved themselves. But Jesus, as you know, could not perform many mighty deeds in Capernaum because of the hard-heartedness of the people in that city. Now, what was the problem with them? Why couldn't they respond to Jesus? And the indication is that, is that nobody from Capernaum responded. And that seems to be the suggestion of the, of the, in the context. There is this old saying that the morning shows the day. The morning shows the day. That is, uh, if you look at the morning, the shape of the day is already written on it, so it cannot change. And this is a metaphoric way of saying that if you can watch a child up to the age of five, you can virtually write the biography of that person. You can predict how that person, and in fact, Psychology took it very seriously. 
one of the greatest of all psychologists. Um, uh, what is his name? I oh. uh, based, based in um, uh, Vienna. Mm. Okay, He'll, his name will come, come to my uh, mind in, in a short while. Now, his book is Understanding of Human Nature. Now, there he emphatically says his entire theory is based on the thesis, you know, uh, hypothesis, that uh, 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 the main characteristics of a person will be revealed before that person is five years old. Adler, uh, his name is Adler, psych psychologist Adler. He is considered the father of personality psychology. Um, Freud was the father of uh, uh, the psychology uh, of psychiatry. Um, Jung was uh, the enunciator of the collective unconscious, etc. But the great contribution that Adler made uh, is the psychology of personality. So the morning shows the day. Now here I must uh, perhaps I should make a reference to what uh, another. Uh, uh, a German philosopher said, he said, man cannot live without superstition. Man cannot live without superstition. He, is, he, was, he says this in the context of saying that no religion in the world is without superstition. Then, of course, he says that specifically in the context of peace, priestcraft. It, it's in a dialogue, sorry, a religion a dialogue by Arthur Schopenhauer that he puts forward the thesis that uh, priesthood is born in hypocrisy. And uh, one of the reasons he points out there is that um, human beings cannot live without superstition. Therefore, human being seems to be, as per Schopenhauer's understanding, hardwired in, in a certain limitation. People feel at home with superstition. There's a tendency to go back into the world of superstition ever and anno. Why is that so? Is there some inherent flaw in God's creation created in the image and likeness of God and yet human beings can't live with the superstition? Or as the great uh, English uh, 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 novelist of uh, Polish origin, Joseph Conrad writes in one of the novels, Lord Jim, he says, man cannot stand too much of reality. Man cannot stand too much of reality. So he needs an alternative to truth. That's what he's saying. So uh, there is this issue. The question is, is it really possible for human beings to make a new beginning? And that this is the central question I wanted to introduce by referring to this piece of thought because this is very vital to the discussion on Jesus's baptism. Is if everything is determined in advance, and if people cannot choose to be different from the way they have been, and therefore it is impossible for human beings to make a new beginning, then what is the function of faith? What is the status of uh, baptism, rituals, so on and so forth. By the way, um, in fact, I don't have the book with me at the moment. It's somewhere in my library. Uh, a book that appeared in 212 by an American psychologist, which uh, the book has become quite famous. He explicitly argues that freedom of choice is a delusion. It doesn't exist. All our choices and actions are determined by factors beyond our control. He says, we may have the feeling that we are making free choices, but it says that that is, that is a delusion. It, does, it, it doesn't exist anywhere. Uh, I, look up, uh, I look up the reference, precise, precise reference, and uh, let you have it through the notes I'll send subsequently. So some of these things must be uh, in our minds as we discuss the baptism of Jesus. I say this because... The tendency in the Christian world is to discuss anything religious in isolation from the world of thought. I believe that this is quite dangerous. I believe this is stupid and it makes us stupid. Uh, spirituality is the liberation of the mind. I think of spirituality as an experience in which the mind sprouts wings 
and flies in the horizon of unprecedented and unimaginable possibilities. That's my idea of freedom, by the way. Otherwise, what is freedom? Freedom to go round and round the rugged rock? Freedom to be like the donkey in the city of, or in the village of Bethany? The, that donkey was also free because it could move around that particular tree within the radius of the rope that tied it to the tree. That limited freedom. Is that the freedom that Jesus promises? Is that the freedom of spiritual birthright? Or is the freedom that we are entitled to imbued with a far greater horizon of possibilities? In which case, is it not a sacred duty on our part to claim it, to exercise it, and to celebrate it? And even more importantly, is not such a freedom basic to Jesus' idea of life in all its fullness? After all, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says that, and I quote, I have come that they may have life and life in all its fullness. How can you have life in all its fullness if your freedom is like the freedom of the donkey, the freedom only to go round and round the same tree, which is called orthodoxy? So these are very serious issues. And I, can, I can only plead with you to continue to reflect on these questions. So therefore, the re we need to confront and answer this question. Is the possibility of making a new beginning feasible at all for human beings? Or to put it uh, differently, are human beings really free to make a new beginning? Or is Jesus' promise to make everything new or to make us a new creation, hollow and empty? If Jesus' promise that he who is in, in him becomes a new creation, as stated by Paul, Jesus himself does not say this. Uh, Jesus, of course, says to Nicodemus, he must be born again. And then, of course, Paul takes it up and interprets it in the second letter to Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 as, the new creation, etc. Everybody is familiar with it, and I will not go into those details. So, are we free to make a new beginning? If we are not, then I have another question to ask. How does that assumption rub on the idea of this, the Eucharist, the Mass, as the Catholics say, or the Holy Supper, or the Holy Communion, sorry, the Holy Communion? Can the wine and the wafer turn into the body and blood of Jesus Christ? If material things can undergo that radical sub, uh, sub, uh, 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 change, what's called transubstantiation, how, how come that human beings cannot? After all, as Swami Vivekananda said, you know, he had a wonderful two-tier idea of freedom. He said that freedom sleeps in the mineral world, it wakes up in the vegetable and um, uh, animal world, and it becomes full consciousness in the human world. Then in another passage, he says that freedom is not, uh, uh, freedom is severely restricted in the material uh, realm. He doesn't say that it doesn't e exist at all. He says freedom is severely restricted in the material world. It's only in the spiritual sphere that freedom becomes real. Right? And therefore, the point is, if a human being thinks of himself only as the body, the physical life, then that person renounces freedom. It's only when we are empowered by the spirit that we enter into uh, an expanded world of freedom. And to the extent that we do so, we prove that we are in the spirit. Otherwise, the idea that we are in the spirit becomes a false claim. So the body and the blood um, are resulting from the change that the material things undergo. Now, therefore, now coming, I'm now coming straight into the baptism of Jesus. The question that I want to ask is this. 
is or, or was the baptism of Jesus only an empty ritual or did it signify a new beginning? I raise this question because even John the Baptist is confused about it. When Jesus comes to be baptized by him, he says, I have the need to be baptized by you. Then Jesus tries to persuade him and say that, you know, consent for, for this moment, for it is necessary that we fulfill all righteousness. So even John the Baptist is confused about this. So what is, what is the significance of this baptism? And for us, it is important to have a clear idea of the meaning and significance of Jesus' baptism because necessarily always the, the baptism of Jesus is identified as the prototype and the rationale for the ritual of baptism practiced in churches. And to what extent the two are similar, etc. We'll have, I mean, we had a little discussion last week, but we'll continue the discussion, time permitting this week as well. Okay. I'll keep that question at the back of your uh, back of your mind. Now, uh, did Jesus make a new beginning? It is quite possible for us to argue that this, what seems to be the new beginning that Jesus makes at the age of thirty, was a beginning that already existed in him at his birth, and therefore there is no new beginning. It's only a public kind of display of something that remained hidden as uh, remained hidden for 30 years so that it is certainly possible to argue that and it will be very difficult to refute that argument at any rate keep that question at the back of your mind now let's therefore ask a, a supplementary question why did jesus want to be baptized it's actually more surprising because after all John was administering the baptism of repentance. Repentance presupposes sin. Jesus is entirely without sin. And probably this was why the Baptist was very confused. After all, he, the Baptist was very clear about who Jesus was. In the, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 19, when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him, it is he who bears witness to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. So, of course, John is intelligent, spiritually is intelligent enough to know that only the sinless, the sinless person can take away the sin of the world. So, he knew that Jesus was sinless. There was no doubt about it. After all, even as a little babe in the womb of Elizabeth, he had responded to Jesus. So, there is a kind of uh, clarity of understanding. What gets John the Baptist confused is not the identity of Jesus, but the logic of the need for his baptism. And therefore, it's an important thing for us to try and attain some clarity on this. Now, what, when John the Baptist objects to this, what does Jesus say? He says, it is necessary that we fulfill the righteousness of God. Therefore, my friends, it is indisputable that there is a connection between baptism and God's righteousness. Now, if you have any disagreement, you can tell me. If you go by the text, and if Jesus' baptism is the prototype for our own baptism, it is clear without any shadow of doubt that there is a connection, there must be a connection between, between baptism and the righteousness of God. Now, therefore, nothing becomes baptism which remains insensitive to the righteousness of God. Who is a baptized person? A baptized person is not a church member. Your church membership is no proof that you are really baptized. If you go by the meaning of Jesus' baptism, a baptized person is one who thereafter remains committed to implementing, giving effect to the righteousness of God. And it is this that Jesus underlines in the Gospel of, of St. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 13. It's a, it's, a, it's a verse that we learn by heart in Sunday schools. Seek first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you, right? That is the righteousness of God. That's a fundamental duty of anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus. Um, as a Christian today, we may not even pay any heed to it, but biblically there is not an, a shadow of doubt on this that nothing is baptism, nothing amounts to baptism if it does not lead to a lifelong commitment to the righteousness of God. That is why I say, and I've said this before also, and it bears repetition, that a Christian is one who is inspired by a sense of mission. What is mission? Mission is the endeavor to incarnate God's righteousness in the given context. That is mission. You don't have to go to distant places for mission. Wherever you are, you are a missionary. If you're a Christian, you're a missionary. So that is something that I want to underline. Now, fulfilling God's righteousness does not come naturally to us. Now, here there is a huge problem. Who created our nature? Well, God created our nature. Then why is it that fulfilling God's righteousness does not come naturally to us? That's where the doctrine of sin comes in. The original, uh, the original uh, sin and fall, etc. There is a flaw in human nature. Whether the fall of man happened exactly in that manner, something like the Garden of Eden existed or did not exist, whether Satan did come or did not come in the form of a serpent, whether that serpent could open its mouth and speak such wonderful things, such seductive logic, these things I don't know. But one thing I do know, and that is, as Shakespeare says, what a noble piece of work is man, how admirable in reason, etc., etc. But towards the end of that passage, that's Hamlet, Hamlet's soliloquy, he says, but what is he to me but the quintessence of dust? This kind of monstrous contradiction in human nature, right? And there must be some explanation for it. And certainly, <clears throat> the story of the fall of man, as recorded in the third chapter of the book of Genesis, is, is quite valuable from that point of view. Because I have not come across in world literature a better ex uh, mythological uh, intuitive explanation of this very basic human reality that uh, human species as a whole has to live with. So, the new begin. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that fulfilling God's righteousness does not come naturally to us. And therefore, something like a quantum leap needs to happen from the plane on which we live prior to, say, baptism, and the plane to which we shift through baptism, where a commitment to fulfilling the righteousness of God becomes the guiding principle of life. It doesn't come naturally to us. Now, almost every book I have read on spirituality agrees on one principle, and that is Spirituality relates to all those qualities and potencies that do not come to us naturally. Our life in nature, our life in the material world, has its own potencies and possibilities. But there are possibilities beyond that, the natural and the supernatural. Now, there are two things. One is nature, then there is culture, then there is spirituality. Nature is a common factor. From nature, man takes a journey either to culture, which is man-made world of potencies and possibilities, the principal insignia of which is science and technology. That's one di direction we can take, materialism and the great powers of materialism symbolized by science and technology. But from nature, we can take another journey, and that is towards the life of the spirit. 
and the life of the spirit has got its own potencies and powers that's the holy spirit okay so either way there is a quantum leap now as far as the leap from nature to the world of the spirit is concerned it is assumed to be a far more radical re uh, leap than the move the movement from nature to culture so nature to culture is more natural because you can actually follow the laws of nature themselves master them create the world of culture it's what you create but you can't do that as far as the world of the spirit is concerned there something beyond human power is at work that's also the reason why the laws and the uh, principles of that world are not subject to verification which is what allows the proliferation of superstition in that realm that's the unfortunate part of it in the material world things can be verified but in the life of the spirit nothing can be verified the only thing we can do is to cultivate spiritual discernment so that we can see through charlatans and impostors but if you don't cultivate if you don't acquire spiritual maturity spiritual discernment you will be readily taken in by these uh, swindlers and cheats the actors in the theater of hypocrisy and they are everywhere some may be more uh, you know competent or um, uh, Uh, shall we say unscrupulous than others but they're all the same so there must be a shift and jesus's baptism is indicating that shift why i say this is now look at the symbolism as jesus emerges from the baptismal waters what happens two things happen one the heavens open and the spirit of god in the form of a dove descends on jesus okay so said some a new possibility is opened up something that did not happen till then that is there is no evidence in the four gospels that it happened before the baptism of jesus the second thing that happens is that there is the restoration of a lost dialogue god speaks Now in the third chapter of Genesis God used to come to the garden of Eden to have daily conversation with Adam and Eve in other words the primal life was distinguished by a regular communication between God and human beings and in the post lapsarian world and that post lapsarian means after the fall in the post lapsarian world that communication gets disrupted okay and it's because that communication got disrupted and it was vital for human beings to have that communication restored that the son of god has to come as the word and that's why john in the gospel chapter 1 verses 1 2 and 3 identifies jesus as the word in the beginning was the word the word was with god the word was god and identifies the word as the creator without him nothing was made that was made these are all familiar passages okay um so it was it is very essential to restore the lost conversation in other words i'm now using a technical word the lost commu communication now the holy eucharist or the holy communion is an aspect of this because the word communication community communion all three come from the same root commune which is to hold together to be together to have the same things in common okay so <clears throat> The, the the baptism of jesus christ therefore to me is a very profound step in his life and jesus was aware of it 
and John the Baptist was vaguely aware of it. That's why he got disturbed without being able to comprehend. So from that time onwards, there's a clear cut shift in the medium of Jesus's life. Till then he lived a private life. And from now onwards, that private life is renounced. Jesus becomes an integral part of the life of the people. He doesn't become the, an integral part of the life of a religion. Jesus was not religious. By the way, Christians don't realize that Jesus was not a Christian. Okay? So, what was till then, now I'm coming to John's baptism a little bit, what was till then only an external principle, namely, as I said in the last session, a non-Jew converted to Judaism was subjected to the baptism of repentance. He was brought to, say, either the water of Jordan or any uh, uh, flowing or standing river, uh, uh, water body, and then baptized. Now, that was an external principle. The water, was, the water was an external principle. It washed only the external. And it was assumed, like in all um, uh, 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 priestly uh, equations, it was assumed that the external principle somehow became the internal principle. You know, this is a problem in the, in, the, in the tradition of all priesthood. There's always this confusion between the external and the internal. And it is quite arbitrarily, and I want to emphasize the word arbitrarily, it is arbitrarily assumed that the external is the internal. I mean, I, I have meditated on this, researched on this, analyzed this, thought, worried, dreamt. I can't for the life of me make out the logic for asserting that the external is also the internal. Now, for example, take the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. You are, you are eating two, two elements, right? Bread, bread and uh, wine. When, when do they become the body and blood of Jesus Christ? The great difference between the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches, I'm not taking uh, sides with any. Catholics say that because the priests say their prayers on the wine and wafer, they become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, at, even before the communicants receive the elements in faith, they are already the body and blood of Jesus Christ. All Reformed churches say that this is not true. This is a misrepresentation. Wine and wafer, stay wine and wafer. Even after the prayer said by the priest, the priest does not have the power to transform them into the body and blood of Jesus. They may become the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the life of the communicant if he has faith. That is the Protestant position. You, you see the huge difference? What is the difference? In the Catholic tradition, this miracle of transforming wine and wafer into the blood and body of Jesus Christ becomes the power of this priest. Well, you say the power, power of the prayer, but the prayer, prayer is mediated by the priest. And the extreme authority of the priest and the prelate is based on this. But in the Protestant tradition, the emphasis shifts from the priest to the believer. The priest is innocent, right? It's up to you through your life of faith to turn that into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So uh, the internal principle, what was till then an external principle, the water of Jordan, for the first time through the baptism of Jesus becomes an internal principle. Now, water is a very interesting item, water. The interesting thing about water is that it can exist both internally and externally. And externally, you can have a bath, and it's a good thing to have a bath. I mean, I cannot give a talk without having a bath at uh, 30 or 30 minutes or 45 minutes before that. I must have. If, I, there have been times when I've given five sermons on the same day and I've had five baths 
because it is so refreshing. It's a great thing to have a bath. But there's a difference between the bath water and the water that you drink. That is the issue. That is a different order altogether. So that which is an external principle becomes an internal reality. And that is the, 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 the hallmark of uh, the baptism of Jesus. Okay. Well, I can't linger more on, on those because time is running out. Um, now, next, let's, let us proceed to the structure of this event. What's happening at the... What's happening through the birth of Jesus? Through the sorry, uh, baptism of Jesus, through the baptism of Jesus, a great bridging process is taking place. Heaven and earth are bridged. How? Through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's a very beautiful thing. As I said, the disruption between heaven and earth is healed and the communion between heaven and earth is restored through the birth of Jesus. And that's the symbolism used there. Heaven opening and the spirit of God descending on Jesus. So the meaning of this particular structure is that baptism must result in the eradication of alienation. Baptism must result in the eradication of alienation. But what has happened in our midst? Baptism has become the means of alienation. Each denomination claims its own baptism to be the real thing. Uh, you know, should it be by immersion, whether it be by uh, affusion, or it should be by sprinkling, <laughs> or on which day, and how soon, or how late, and all kinds of things. Right? It's very unfortunate. Now, baptism, as I said, signals a new beginning. And therefore, based on that, let's take, uh, consider a few more aspects. To what extent is the baptism of Jesus, which is considered as a new beginning, if you accept my argument, to what extent is the baptism of Jesus as signifying a new beginning, a religious thing? Can this be a religious thing at all? And to what extent is this a universal treasure? Specifically, let me ask you a question. Can any religion accommodate new beginnings? I leave that question with, uh, to me, is one of the most important questions that I can raise. Can religions accommodate new beginnings? Of course, the answer is prefigured in the crucifixion of Jesus. The answer is already there. Now, if you look at the preachings that uh, go on, and you know, great... Uh, uh, rhetorical paths are lavished on persuading people to repent and to make a new beginning and all the rest of it. But after you make a new beginning by joining a church, then you thereafter, if you make a new beginning, you will be thrown out. That's the point. You must make a new beginning only for my sake. But if you make a new beginning that's to my inconvenience, then you will face the consequence. That That is the reality. Okay? Suppose... As a member of a church, you want to make a new beginning hmm? and uh, you feel that uh, your spiritual needs are better served somewhere else. What happens? You'll be sent a joyful farewell. You'll be given a joyful farewell and sent off. <laughs> so uh, think about these things. Uh, by the way, one of the greatest philosophers in, the, in, in, in Europe, uh, and with, uh, Zach is very, very familiar with his arguments. Uh, Spinoza, Baruch uh, Spinoza, he, he became a, a Christian, his name was Benedict uh, Spinoza. Uh, he was excommunicated by the Jews for his new thoughts. Uh, he didn't commit a crime, he was not caught in any sin, simply because he thought differently from the gang, 
uh, from the general run of things, he was excommunicated. And if you read the text of excommunication, your heart will break. I mean, how cruel, how cruel can it be? No. So, um, uh, uh, this is something that if you want, you, we can discuss at the end. So, a crucial issue in religion is our attitude to what is new and what is radical. Now, there is, of course, there are many indications to this, but for illustrative purposes, let me just take one that's very familiar to all of us. In the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, when the younger son who is lost and who went and made a fool of himself in the far country returns, right? I will arise and go back to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you and I'm no longer uh, you know, uh, uh, good enough to be called your son, accept me as one of your servants, etc. What was he doing? He was making a new beginning, no? What do you think he was doing? He was making a new beginning. What happened? Did the brother like it? Did the elder brother like it? Jesus is actually demonstrating the difference between two attitudes. The attitude of the father, the father in heaven, the attitude of the brother. That's a religious attitude. Your core religion is. There's a hard burn if you make a new beginning. That's a reality. Okay. So, um, the when we stigmatize and criminalize the human freedom to make a new beginning without which there is no spirituality there is no kingdom of god as absolutely clear and as i have said on on occasions before this is the one thing that organized religion cannot accommodate that's why jesus was crucified and that's why heretics were burned at stake and today of course people are not burned at stake because religious uh, authorities do not have that power, but people are put to great torment spiritually, emotionally, even practically. So, when when this happens, what does it reflect on the religion that we are practicing, we are adhering to? To what extent is it authentic? On what is it based? If a pattern that is so fundamental to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ is alien to the structures that we are so loyal to, then what are we to make of it? And this, I believe, is a very serious issue. Now, when, when we close the doors, and this is, I'll close on that, then we can have discussions. When we close the doors on new possibilities, you know what happens to us? We become overwhelmed or besieged by a very perverse psychology. And the psychology is a psychology of being besieged. Because what happens is this. When you shut the door on new possibilities, you create a closed world which is stagnant. But the world beyond your hedges, your borders, is changing. Continuously, newer things are emerging. And you cannot but encounter newer people, different people, newer thoughts, newer insights, etc. Nothing stands still. History is not a pool of stagnant water. It is a mighty rushing Amazon River. So what happens? You have you develop a tendency to wall yourself in, barrier yourself, protect yourself, incubate yourself. And this psychology breeds all kinds of pathologies, psychological pathologies. You get the feeling that the world around you is teeming with enemies. And you sincerely believe that it is so. Is there any factual content to your fears? No. Nor is it necessary. The fact is that you have that fear and you think that it is enough that you feel that fear very intensely. 
And I believe that this is what's happening to the Catholic Church in Kerala. You know, whichever way you look, there are enemies. Love jihad, narcotic jihad, hmm? then ice cream jihad. Where are you? I mean, I'm not saying that the persons who say this are faking. No, they may be they may be feeling it absolutely genuinely. But that doesn't mean that it is truthful. You know, in psychological disorders, people feel very intensely. You know, the, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the life of uh, Waikam Muhammad Bashir. Waikam Muhammad Bashir had spells of madness. In one episode, he began to hallucinate that Satan had come to attack him. So he's grabbed two knives and he was brandishing those two knives at his wife and his children because he said Satan is a deceiver and he can come in any form. He can come in the form of my wife, my children and uh, the news spread and some of his friends including uh, uh, M.T. Vasudevan Nair came to because M.T. Vasudevan Nair had a very close relationship with Vaikam Muhammad Bashir and Vasudevan Nair considered Bashir to be his guru. He always used to call him guru, in fact. So Vasudevan Nair tried to uh, pacify uh, MT and uh, Bashir and said, uh, Guru, um, this is your uh, disciple, uh, MT. Uh, put, put down the knife. Uh, nobody is attacking. Then Bashir says, what is the guarantee that the devil will not come in the form of MT Vasudevan Nair? Right? Now, B B Bashir at that point, point in time sincerely believed that his wife was the devil, his children were devils, Vasudevanar was the devil. Anyway, finally he was persuaded to go to a mental hospital and treated and all that. That's, I will not go into the rest of the story. So what I'm saying is, the fact that we feel strongly about certain things does not mean that its factual content is actually verifiable or will stand scrutiny. It may well be that we have invited these apprehensions because of the kind of internal weaknesses we have embraced by the sort of negativity we have cultivated and inflicted upon ourselves. Now, if you create a world which is closed, my dear friends, take it from me. You will be subject to all kinds of psychological aberrations. I mean, imagine you're living shut up in your own home, your own home. For uh, 10 years, you don't open your doors, your windows, right? Because you feel that uh, the world outside is full of enemies. What will happen to you? The same thing is happening to us. Let us assume, let's assume that all these dangers are real. Let's assume that I'm going to concede. But then the question is, what is the Christian way of relating and responding to them? Nobody asks, nobody is bothered, everybody is how to defend. Is there or is there not something called a Christian response? What do you think is a Christian response to a situation like love jihad? The central agency, NIA, says there is no love jihad. The Supreme Court says there is no love jihad. The government of Kerala says there is no love jihad. The in I information uh, inter intelligence bureau says, okay, let's assume that there is love jihad. What is, the, what is the response? How shall we respond to it? Suppose, there is, let's say that there is narcotic uh, jihad. What is the way to respond? Think about these things. So what I'm saying is that unless and until we are willing to make a new beginning, we cannot begin to be Christians. This idea that, you know, we are all traditional Christians and we have been baptized and some of us have been confirmed and, you know, at every significant moment, their priest has come and said some prayer over us and we are taking communion regularly. We are offering this offering, that offering, free will offering, unfree will offering, all kinds of... And therefore, we are... And this doesn't wash. It doesn't wash. So... The significance of the birth of the baptism of Jesus Christ is something that we need to really meditate on, go into depth, appropriate that meaning and connect it to our life, life of the church, to the various pretensions and assumptions that we make and see where we stand. 
first of all now go back to the original thought i introduced is it really possible to make a new beginning if it is not possible then forget about everything right is it possible to become a new creation if my exercise of my free will or as uh, uh, theologians usually say if i do not turn freely to god using my freedom of choice freedom is given to us that we may freely turn to god and then become the new creation through christ jesus which is actually baptism and thereafter remain committed to making the righteousness of god real on earth which is captured by jesus in the model prayer he taught us our father in heaven hallowed be your name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven that is baptism that's a baptismal prayer though it is never understood in that sense the meaning of baptism is clearly formulated in the lord's prayer but for us nothing of the sort uh, 40th day or whatever day according to your tradition the child is uh, taken to the church the priest sprinkles some water or whatever uh, the child cries and howls and brings the roof down uh, and uh, that's it fine wonderful a new christian is added to the fold and this goes on and i think the time has come for us to think biblically think biblically think biblically that's all i'm saying don't accept any of my conclusions don't accept any of my interpretations for god's sake think because i believe the mind has been given to us by god not by satan satan prevents us from thinking because only when we are prevented from thinking can we be hijacked right so there i pause and uh, we can now have questions and interactions well before we begin that let me felicitate my friend kamado uh, suresh now i must call him reverend kamado suresh right thank you god bless you and i'm sure that um, you will you will show the light of your free understanding of the life and teachings of jesus christ through your ministry thank you reverend thank you so much i have five great faith and i look forward to that okay thank you well let, let, let's have uh, interactions yes can i say yes wonderful ronnie how are you okay fine fine uh at the time of baptism the yes. we there is a the god parents who is an individual or whatever but then ultimately the whole church are kind of god parents uh and there is a momentary acknowledgement by everybody the godfather himself or godmother at that particular moment is not totally committed to um uh, heaven uh he's just an ordinary man who sins today uh, confesses to, to tonight and is a newborn person kind of thing so but this baptism as soon as it is done on a child suddenly a sense of realization or the seriousness of that uh duty captures you yes. momentarily yes. and you commit that child uh um to be brought up in heaven's ways yes. and it is your sincere belief that you are going to do it whether it happens or not uh from what i've seen we are all fallible no? and uh and then we have a repent this is where the word as far as i know there's being born again it's a momentary experience which is not a permanent uh, uh feeling of salvation salvation so even the god parents they also have a sincere um intention uh but that's where they crack up you know so uh we need to be extremely conscious and the only way of being conscious really is to have a constant surrounding of people of god 
in you. Okay. And that and that kind of controls you and brings you back from going astray. You know? um, All right. so that, uh, interesting. But the only thing I have, the only question I would ask is, when you say that the godparents are sincere, and you go on also to add a further twist by saying that at that particular moment when water is sprinkled on the baby, the god godparents exp experience something, something of an elevated state, etc. Uh, I quite agree that is that is the case. But the, uh, uh, let me offer a, a particular reflection on that. You see, what's happening, uh, Rene, is that our religious sentiments are consistently being reduced only to the emotional part. Yeah. I'm going to say something extremely important. Now, even when, as you say, the two individuals, or in some cases, four individuals, God parents, are sincere. That sincerity is only emotional. Yeah. And the feeling of high is also only emotional. Why? Now let me explain why it is that this sincere feeling dies very young. It doesn't last. Okay? Now, yeah. A human being is not only mere emotion. A human being has at least three major aspects. I've written about this in my book, um, uh, uh, Thoughts for Trying Times. A human being is a thinking human being. A human being is a willing per, uh, being. A human being is also a feeling being. Think will feel okay now everything begins with feeling but if it remains only at the level of feeling and it does not grow into the level of thinking and willing there is no there is no willing without thinking for example at the time of feeling sincere what parents must think now what does the sincerity involve what is this responsibility that I am taking upon myself and what does that entail for me for the next, say, 20 years or, say, 10 years? Nobody thinks. That feeling is very nice. I've got that feeling. And the system also only plays up that feeling. Okay? That's why there is no follow-up. Why is it that there is no follow-up on the part of the church or the priest to see whether or not godparents are uh, remaining faithful to the yeah. promises that make in the presence of God, presumably? Yeah. Right? It's because it's only feeling. Feelings are momentary. If you abstract feeling from thinking and willing, it's only momentary. It's like a bubble. So it's a nice, colorful bubble. It comes up and suddenly, soon enough, it bursts. This is why I'm arguing from start to finish that our religious response must become holistic. That is to say, it must proceed from feelings are important, emotions are extremely important. I'm not belittling it. I'm saying that it must be complete, it must be holistic. It must, from feeling, we must go to thinking and thinking to willing and action. Yeah. Okay. Now, godparents think, uh, feel, but they don't act. That's why, you know, T.S. Eliot in one of his poems says about the predicament of the modern man. The title of the poem is The Hollow Man. Between the intention and the effect falls a shadow. Between the intention and the effect falls a shadow. Right? Nothing. The modern man has actually messed up the whole thing because he has renounced holistic life, holistic personality in the interest of convenience. Yeah. If you always take the line of least resistance, then you live only at the level of momentary feelings. Yeah. The ethical life is possible only when you're willing to commit yourself to consistent action. And this is what Immanuel Kant calls commitment to maxims. Maxims are universal principles which are not subject to <coughs> vicissitudes based on 
expediency or shift in context and situations. It's the same everywhere, whether it is America or Kerala or uh, UK, it's the same principle, okay? Love is love, truth is truth, compassion is compassion, etc. Uh, so that these, are, these are called universal maxims, right? So consistent subjection of oneself to practicing universal maxims is a sign of maturity. Anyone can feel nice about things. Everyone can feel even fervor. Um, haven't you seen when you go to conventions, the preacher, if he has the art, whips up the feelings of the people. Hallelujah and all the rest of it. And even before the final amen, he said, gossip will begin. Gossip. Okay. It's, the, the, the tail of the dog is back to the original shape. Why? Because the, that, the feeling was successfully whipped up, but nothing else was involved there. But this can create a huge impression on people without discernment. That's why these people are very hot in the market. Yes, Therefore, we need to actually spread this sort of understanding. Yes, it's very good to have emotions, but emotions by themselves are horribly inadequate. Suppose Jesus had only good intentions and he did not act. After all, what does the cross mean? The cross means he willed and acted. You know? That's what is called accomplished task. There is nothing accomplished in our life. What is accomplished? In the life of any Christian over 50 years, what is accomplished? We're just drifting from day to day, day to day. As a result of which, the power of the faith is never experienced by anyone. That is what concerns me. And that's precisely the issue that I'm trying to. And I'm very grateful to you for raising this question. Because I think even without knowing it, you do a lot of good. There's something wrong with you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, the thing is, uh, when you're an ordinary guy and somebody comes up to say, and uh, says, oh, my child is going, I want my child to be baptized, and I want you to be the godfather, suddenly, there's a kind of a bolt that hits you. Yes, yes, yes. And you have a real sincere, and since this topic of this baptism came up, I have been a little bit guilty in a manner. A sense of guilt has occurred in me because I'm the godfather of three children. And whenever I talk to them, I said, I hope you're studying well. Be careful. Pray. You must never forget to pray and uh, hold on to his hand. And uh, these are, in a manner, mere words, yeah. hand on my heart. Yes, yes. But these are good messages and I keep hoping that he will listen to it. But Am I doing the same thing? Um, many a time I fall. So the level of sincerity in me as being the preacher to this innocent boy who I'm trying to expose kingdom values yes, yes. Is, uh, is false. See, Ren Rene, this very realization is very sacred. That's the point. You know, in the gospel, in the parable of the lost son, the point at which he says, look at me, you know, I am in the company of pigs. Yeah. I will get up and go back to my father. That is the most sacred moment think, yeah. in the Bible. <clears throat> you understand? So the, the point is, un, unless and until these things are discussed in our midst, there will be no change. Yeah. My intention, believe you me, is not to discredit anyone. I mean, don't misunderstand. It is my duty to share what life has taught me over a long period of time, what consistent study of the of Jesus' teachings as life has taught me over a long period of time with others in the hope that if there is any sense in it, people may act on it yeah. or make it their own. I mean, otherwise, just cast it aside. I don't have a problem. But it's not my intention to discredit anyone. But I know one thing for sure, and I'm duty bound to say this, these conventional practices have lost all meaning. Yes. Otherwise, do you think if a child is really baptized, you have to worry about love jihad? You really have to? You see, when you cry about love jihad, you don't realize that you're actually spitting on your own face in public. You are saying that your faith is weaker than 
a, a, a Muslim boy who walks past your, past your daughter. That's what you're saying. You're saying that your faith is good for nothing. That the way of Jesus Christ is brittle than the wings of a butterfly. That's what you're saying in public. People don't know this. They think it's a great thing to beat their breast in public. You are actually discrediting yourself right royally in public. So I think the time has come for us to insist on a more holistic, more complete paradigm of religious experience, which includes at the very least, at the very least, not only these emotional responses, but also thinking and willing and acting. Now, for example, take uh, the Pentecostal emphasis on speaking in tongues. When do people speak in tongues? See, frankly, whenever I'm bored, and I don't have uh, people around me these days, whenever I want to aff afford myself some amusement, I look, uh, look up uh, the um, YouTube and get clippings on uh, the Pentecostal pastor speaking in tongues. It gives me tremendous amusement. And I watch it. To tell you the truth, I watch it. So what is happening? You see, they work themselves up emotionally to a frenzy. And then they start mumbling and jumbling and this, that, and the other. Purely emotional. It is incompatible with an iota of thinking. Nothing ever comes out of it. For all the speaking in tongues, nothing has ever happened in the last 70 years. I mean, these things are right in front of you. How can you uh, say that you know, we don't understand it? Okay? Therefore, it's important for us to spread the word around that this will not do. This is why we cannot face the world. We feel that our, our faith life is a bubble. It will, it will burst and disappear into nothing. If somebody comes and blows on it, therefore, we must protect ourselves. Our, our faith is in danger. This is not the way of Jesus Christ. This much I'm sure about. It's up to you. Okay, any, any further questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes, and uh, good, welcome. I can't put on the video because there's no electricity here. Doesn't matter. Let Doesn't me matter. ask yeah. my question. Yes. Um, this is about a portion that we didn't speak about today, which yes. is uh, where John the Baptist says um, that Jesus will baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So yes. what what does that mean? I'm thinking that when, whenever I hear the word fire, I think about trials. Does it have anything to do with that? Uh, you think about? Uh, think about something difficult, like a difficult. trial. Okay, okay, yes, yes. okay, yes. Uh, now, fire in the religious context usually denotes sacrifice, purity, fire. And fire is, of course, is a, fire is akin to light. You can't separate fire from light and light from fire, right? Yeah. So the spirit, now spirit stands for the wholeness of things. You know, when Jesus says to Nicodemus, that, uh, uh, you know, the wind blows where it pleases, nobody knows where it comes from, where it goes. Actually, what he means is that the spirit pertains to the totality of things which is over which no man has any control okay uh, and therefore the baptism of uh, the baptism that Jesus will uh, uh, practice by the way Jesus did not baptize anyone in a ritualistic manner John says the one who comes after me will baptize you with the fire and the spirit right have you seen Jesus baptizing anyone ritualistically? Yes, he baptized many people, but not ritualistically. Jesus rejected ritualism completely. This is something that Christians find very shocking to hear, much less accept. So Jesus' idea of baptism is very different. It's time we realize this. Can there be a baptism without a ritual? And this is a question that Zach raised previously, whether this kind of baptism should be practiced in India. My answer is the baptism of baptism that Jesus practiced should be pra pra practiced. And that is 
non-ritualistic baptism, baptism of the spirit and uh, fire and the spirit, the water and the spirit, sorry, water and the spirit. Now, which, as I said, integrates the individual into the righteousness of God, making him a new creation. The idea of baptism as an initiation ceremony into not only one religion, but particular denominational churches, one at loggerheads with the other, that is not the baptism that Jesus would ever have envisaged. Not even John the Baptist, by the way. It's a far cry from what was envisaged at that time. Okay. So if you are baptized, therefore, you are committed or you must have a commitment to the totality of things. Now, for example, uh, religious loyalty brings us under the obligation or compulsion to be partial or unilateral in our understanding and actions. For example, if uh, somebody says that your religion is in danger in Kerala, don't look at the other side. Just believe it. If you are a good question, you must immediately lap up this fear and then begin to militate. Okay. Now, that is not the totality of the situation. You remember the episode in the 8th chapter of John's Gospel when a woman, presumably taken in adultery, is produced before Jesus that he may condemn her. Jesus says, you know, he who has not uh, sinned uh, and in some text sinned with her, cast the first stone. Meaning, look at the other side. Complete the picture. Complete the equation. 2 plus 2 is 4. Don't say 2 plus 4 is equal to, then you do whatever you want. Or it doesn't even exist. The other side of the equation does not exist. So the spirit is a commitment to the totality, the whole, wholeness of things. Because, why is the spirit required? Because it is inherent in human nature to be partial and biased. The real practical proof that you are in the power of spirit or the spirit of God is guiding you is that you experience a passion for truth and truth, is, pertain, truth pertains to the totality of things. That's why when Pontius Pilate asked the question, what is truth? Jesus does not answer the question because by his profession, Pontius Pilate is incapable of being mutual or reciprocal. He is ob obligated to act unilaterally. He is not free to know the truth. He can ask the question, what is truth? But he is not free to know. That's why Jesus does not oblige him. Truth always belongs to the totality of things. All spiritual values belong to the totality of things. And the practical value of all spiritual values is to continuously connect it to the fullness of things, whether it is love, whether it is truth, whether it is compassion, whether it is uh, 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 justice, all of them become real only when we are committed to the total. In the pa parable of the uh, Good Samaritan, what is the idea? The idea is that the priest is committed to a partial worldview. Ironically, the Good Sam the Samaritan has a more holistic view of things. And he's not a priest, he's a lay person. Is a trader. He can have a holistic view of things, but not the priest and the Levite. And that is the, the, the biting irony that Jesus incorporates into that most unforgettable parable, parable of the uh, Good Samaritan. Okay. So. Can I, uh, Walson, can I ask him? Yes. Is exactly. baptism, <laughs> hello, yes. if baptism is a baptism of repentance, how can it be how can it be once for all? Good question. Good question. Now, your question, Zach, raises a further question. And I, I, I have in mind to deal with this as a separate topic very soon. What is repentance? What is repentance? Now, again, as all of us know, this is a concept that has been horribly disfigured by or every church. Do you think repentance is experienced or achieved by making a confession, either the congregational or individual, as in the case of certain traditions like the Orthodox Church, etc.? Now, in Jesus' view, repentance 
has a far greater, far more dynamic meaning. And I will take this up when I discuss the text, Matthew 4, 17, the initial proclamation of Jesus, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So the baptism of repentance that John the Baptist practiced had a limited meaning. And that, was, that is the reason why there is a dissonance. John the Baptist feels un, un, uncomfortable about baptiz, baptizing Jesus because his idea of repentance was limited. We might feel uncomfortable about a prophet being limited in his understanding. But there are many instances in the Bible of prophets being limited. The tradition of prophetism is fulfilled only in Jesus Christ. So he's the perfect prophet. So it is Jesus who gives to the idea of repentance a new meaning a very dynamic meaning, a life-transforming meaning, a very profound meaning. So the baptism of repentance, does it suffice as a, a ritual once and for all? This question has been addressed by theologians in the past. So in some traditions, Zach, what happens is, as part of the New Year service, there's a renewal of baptismal vows. Does your, your church practice it? No, uh, certain, uh, okay. uh, certain judges practice it. So there is a realization that as a one-off event, this is not enough. Perhaps it needs to be revived and reminded of from time to time. But if my understanding of Jesus' baptism or its significance holds water, then I will have to say that even this periodic reminder is no value unless the idea of repentance itself is understood properly. Uh, in fidelity to the teachings of Jesus Christ, to which we shall come in a subsequent session, right? So I would say that, first of all, baptism as it is practiced is not in conformity to the biblical model or the gospel model. And furthermore, say that the idea of repentance that is sometimes app appended to this itself is a far cry from what it is uh, uh, a sort of... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, posited or explained or implied in the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. So whether you repeat it 10 times or 100 times, if the original idea itself is uh, uh, nowhere near the mark, then I believe that uh, it makes no difference. Whether you repeat it or not repeat it, to me it makes no, no, uh, no sense. Or no difference. If baptism can be considered as also a covenant with God, or yeah. God's covenant with us, yes, yes. then the spiritual baptism becomes very meaningful. Isn't it? That is correct. And that is the baptism which Jesus undergoes. That's what I've been yeah. trying to explain so far. That's why I said uh, that the Spirit of God comes, hmm? and uh, you know there's a restoration of the communication between heaven and earth. All that uh, uh, touches upon what you have just now said the uh, baptism in the spirit, right? And that's why, that is why John himself in a way intuits it and says that he who comes after me is greater than me and he will baptize you in the spirit, right? And that baptism does not require this kind of <coughs> priestly ritual. And priestly ritual cannot mediate it. You're not uh, implying that uh, baptism should not be done at all? I'm not implying anything. I'm only saying that this is what it is in the Bible. Inferences you can draw. The so point is, there is no harm in undergoing that because uh, either way, you see, it's like taking a placebo. You know, the, a placebo has no side effects. Yeah. Only a genuine medicine will have side effects. Right? You can take your child, baptize, and forget about it. No harm is done to the child. The only harm is if you make the child believe that, yes, I've been baptized and therefore I'm perfectly all right for the rest of my life, then you do a serious harm to the child. Yes. Then it's no longer placebo, it's poison. But isn't it a commitment, kind of, uh, with sincerity, you hope to have the change within you 
Rene, and, uh, Rene, that commitment only the individual can make. Nobody funny. can do that on your behalf. Yes. Let but me ask does... you. Let me ask you. Can you can somebody else marry on your behalf? Uh, yeah, there are times when I wished it was. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> 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 no, sir, these these fundamental fundamental human experiences cannot be done by proxy. There's no substitution. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Uh, uh, Suresh, I have no, to heed Suresh. Uh, because uh, why are we concentrating on this child baptism? I don't know. Because many of the believers who are coming from the other religions, they have to publicly acknowledge. And they have to go through that experience when you say that, you, you know, it's a covenant relationship which you are going to. And they are given a vow when they are about to baptize in the water. So uh, this is a, at home, whatever you control is in your, in your uh, in control. You have to bring up your children in the, in the faith. That is your responsibility. Whether you baptized early, then have for a confirmation. That's what I feel because I got baptized when I was about... Uh, you know, somewhere around 45 or something like that. So I was very convinced that uh, with this, I am going to die to the sins and rising up with Jesus Christ to be around this. And there is no problem for me. And of course, at that time, many things I didn't know. As you yes. said, it has to be slowly built up in you that, yes. you know, when yes. you read the scriptures, then you understand the seriousness of all the relationship. So it's not a one-day affair. As, as Absolutely. You. So this, this yeah. you should stop this discussion about this child. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. No, uh, uh, Suresh, the discussion veers around the child baptism because that is the predominant model. There are historical reasons why it became a predominant model. But I, uh, the thing is, as you quite rightly say, that even adult baptism is only a beginning. If you are born again, you cannot stay stuck at the level of uh, being born. There has to be a life of growth, right? And actually, the function of a congregation, the body of believers, is to provide the stimulating, nurturing, ideal context for the continuing growth of the baptized person. That's why I have always emphasized that the hallmark of a genuine congregation is that it is a place of growth for everyone, all members. Only a congregation where members are growing towards spiritual maturity and are helping each other to do so is a congregation. The rest is only an assembly of people, a club, so a Sunday club, right? So I quite agree with what you're saying, that the emphasis must be not only on the initial commitment that a person makes, which is very profound. And in your case, because you did it on your individual choice, your volition, your freedom, and in understanding that there was a very great, uh, uh, say, change involved from one to the other. And you also realized that there was a need to consolidate that change through the continuous process of growth thereafter, it made a lot of sense in your life. And, I, and I, that's greatly to be valued. But my, my question is, does it happen? In how many cases? What percentage of uh, Christians has it happened? Or does it happen? Will it happen? That's a concern. So uh, that concern must be shared without uh, uh, making it an allegation or a point of damnation or anything. Were, our job is only to raise awareness. Thank then you. leave leave the choice to the people in a state of accountability to the maker, to God himself. Nobody is accountable to me or to you, right? But we have a duty to sow the seeds, right? In the, uh, Matthew chapter 13, the first parable Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God. The whole of chapter 13 is a compendium of parables on the kingdom of God. A man went out to sow the seed, right? The parable of the sower. Right? Our job is only to sow the seed. Nobody is accountable to me. But if I don't do that, if I don't do that, then I have failed my own life. So, 
in in the Church of England tradition, yes, sir. usually the baptism is taking place during Holy Communion or during worship service. Yes, this is not so in other churches. Yes. I recently attended a wedding, a, a, a baptism, which was like a wedding ceremony of eight 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 hundred people attending, and a huge ceremony, huge festival afterwards. Yes, yes. But in Anglican Anglican tradition, Church of England tradition. The whole congregation repent mm -hmm. together with the parents and grandparents uh, and uh, godparents. Yes, yes. And also the yes. whole congregation accept the child into yes. the church, into the right. faith That's community. Right. That's right. So they take the whole responsibility. It is yes. very much like the African tradition saying a yes. child is brought up by the whole village. That's they are right. open to philosophy and yes. so on and so forth. Yes. Yes. So what is going wrong? Yeah. Both parents and grandparents and the community of the church is yeah. not taking responsibility yeah. for bringing that yeah. child in Christian faith. Yeah. That, that is, is the problem. It's a fully, major problem. Yeah. It's very, very uh, valuable what you're saying. But still, I would also go on to insist, as I have done before, that even when responsibility is accepted, the congregation may not be, uh, congregation concerned may not be aware of the substance of that responsibility. For example, uh, as uh, the present text that we have discussed indicates that baptism is a commitment to living the righteousness of God. Uh, uh, baptism as membership in a well-knit congregational context is, is one thing and it's valuable in itself. But whether it actually leads to a life of mission is something that uh, only you can decide with specific reference to the given congregation sack. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, 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 to the, the limited experience I have of English congregations uh, do not uh, do not make me uh, or allow me to conclude that it happens that way. So, any further question? Uh, Answers. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Good to see. You. Let me at the outset uh, uh, congratulate uh, Commodore Suresh. Yes. Yes. Enough, uh, his priestly duties. That's what I understand. That's what he said. Yes. yes. Uh, I also offer my prayers for uh, a very successful, you know, stint uh, as a religious person. May God bless him. Yes. Uh, Father, about this. Uh, Baptism. Uh, I don't know, I'm a little uh, <coughs> surprised. Uh, what is your duty? To do away, away with, uh, you know, child baptism or uh, is it to just to, you know, make us understand about the duties of uh, God parenting? And beyond that, what else can we do? I mean, we can't do away with uh, baptism. That is a core belief. Faith, of course, is, like they say, that it's a leap into the darkness. But our belief is, belief is that uh, it's a leap into the hands of God. Yeah, yeah. As a child, that child has to be brought into the church. Yeah. That, of course, uh, that can be done only according to our faith and belief. That's what we do uh, as yeah. baptism is concerned. Yeah. Of course, it has to be taken very seriously. That I, I fully agree with you. But uh, what else can we do? What is the other option? Okay. As usual, uh, the questions that Francis asks are very searching questions. And they make me think and sometimes think with trepidation. So let me respond in this manner. You see, one trick that happens always in the, in the domain of religion is the trick of substitution. The trick of substitution. Something is substituted for something else. And this pattern is intuited very early in biblical history through the Tower of Babel. Have, there's a whole chapter on the Tower of Babel in my book. I hope you get hold of it. I know you're trying to get a copy. Of it. If you have any difficulty in getting a copy, please contact Dr. Laji Verghese. No, no, I have already talked to Mr. Thomas. Ah, okay, he's getting it. Okay, fine. So there is a whole chapter on it. Now, what is happening there is 
the people who settled down in the valley of Shinar, they had previously a principle of unity. God was that principle of unity. Now they retain the idea of unity. What are they doing? They are substituting an original principle with something else, which is man-made tower. Now this is an early, very profound symbol, an early warning in biblical, biblical history that human nature has this particular pattern that it always wants to substitute with its own resources. A similar moment, a very crowning moment, is in the book of Exodus. As Moses goes up to the mountain to receive the commandments of God, the people are all amassed at the foothill. And then Moses takes three days and the people get rest as they approach Aaron, his brother, and says, make for ourselves a God. And Aaron fashions out of the gold that they provide a calf, right? So this is substitution. People must have a substitution for the original God. You understand? That's why I, in the beginning, I quoted a statement by, uh, by uh, uh, Schopenhauer, or the Schopenhauer, that human beings cannot live without superstition. Uh, man craves superstition. And that craving for superstition far outweighs the, uh, the, 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 the desire for truth. That is his point of view. You may accept it or not, not accept. I accept it. So, if you keep that pattern at the back of your mind, hmm? now come to the idea of baptism. I am not arguing for the abolition of baptism. I am saying that the understanding of baptism with which baptism as a ceremony is uh, con conducted in our all traditions, not just one or two, all traditions, that understanding does not harmonize with the understanding that we derive from an open-minded, open-hearted understanding of the text that we have pertaining to the baptism of Jesus. That's all that I'm saying. Furthermore, I said that the baptism of Jesus Christ is a very profound experience. The baptism of Jesus does not end there. It is a lifelong baptism. That's the baptism of the spirit, baptism in the spirit. And what is the baptism in the spirit? Life of mission. I would say that Jesus is baptized right up to the death on the cross. And this is not something that I'm inventing. Read the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses the 30, uh, 25 to 37. There, James and John, the sons of Sabadi, asked Jesus for a favor that they should be guaranteed places of preeminence at his second coming. They should sit on the right hand or the left hand side of Jesus. And then Jesus, Jesus says something. Will you be baptized with the baptism that I am going to be baptized with? What is the baptism he's, he's thinking of? His death on the cross. So this is the idea of baptism. There is not just one, a one-off ritual, just a, a begun and accomplished in half an hour in a church. Some godfather saying, yes, 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 some vows, pledges, etc. It is a mockery, actually, if you really think of it. The baptism never ends. It should never end. That is why I'm saying, again, in complete fidelity to the text which I was interpreting, that the essence of baptism is a commitment to fulfilling the righteousness of God. That's what Jesus is saying to John the Baptist. So you can't really understand in honesty, you can't understand baptism in isolation from this necessary emphasis on fulfilling the righteousness of God. That doesn't exist in any tradition, Francis. You, you are, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the Catholic tradition. I'm sure you're also familiar with other traditions. And I, I know it is two, two traditions, like the back of my hand, the CSI and the CNI. It is nowhere in the picture. It is just a ritual and often undertaken in a kind of official, casual manner. The priest, there's a function that the priest has to discharge. He just discharges it and the, the curtains fall on it. That's it. No one ever bothers about it thereafter. I'm only saying that through this kind of casual, 
and the kind of caricatured repetition of a very profound spiritual experience, we are actually renouncing much that is of profound value in our spiritual tradition. That is all that I'm saying. Now, whether or not it is possible for us to retrieve it, reappropriate it, make it an integral and dynamic part of our life together as a church, it's a, it's a question everybody else has to answer. My, my contention is that it should be possible. I can't legislate that it should happen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You gave me an opportunity to make things slightly clearer, which is a, which is a very good thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any further, any further question, anxiety, confusion? Uh, okay. Well, I make it uh, the usual time of applying closure. So thank you very much for continuing with this journey. A very rough terrain, full of potholes. Huh? Uh, and uh, but it's a journey nonetheless. Okay. And I tell you that potholes also have their value when it comes to intellectual life because if the road is smooth on its surface, you never think of the road. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, when you hit a speed breaker or a pothole or a, 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 what's that, a crack somewhere, then you begin to think, right? Your awareness yeah. is born. Yeah. Awareness is born. That is when you begin to think. The problem with us is our church life is too smooth sailing. It is buttery. It is silken. There is nothing that ever makes us think. And that is killing us. So thank you very much. I look forward to, uh, may I assume that next week it is impromptu discussion, question answer session. I'll always be prepared with the topic in case that is necessary. That's my responsibility, but do come with your, and this can be general questions. I'm not that I have answers to all the questions, but if I don't have answers, other members of the group will have answers. We'll benefit from each other's experience and wisdom. I, I, I'm very keen to learn from everyone else. And in this process of interaction, I'm learning a lot. So I look forward to next uh, next week, Saturday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. God bless all of you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.